On several occasions, Jesus used figurative language to describe himself. He called himself the light of the world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he shines the light of righteousness into the darkness of the world. A couple of chapters before that, in John chapter 6, he called himself the bread of life. He gives nourishment to those who are spiritually hungry. He said he is the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, guiding and protecting his flock. He called himself the resurrection and the life. He called himself the way, the truth, and the life. On many of these occasions, these statements were accompanied by miraculous acts to confirm the validity of his claims. When he said he was the bread of life, he had just finished feeding 5,000 people, correction, 5,000 men, not including women and children, with five barley loaves and two small fish. And they had a lot left over afterwards. He called himself the light of the world, and shortly after that, he gave sight to a man who had been born blind. When he said he was res the resurrection and the life, He said that on the occasion of his friend's death, Lazarus. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. But there were other times, however, that his statements were made to his closest disciples. Who already believed. Who didn't need miraculous confirmation. Rather, they just needed information about their friend. Jesus. When he called himself the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus was making the point that there was no access to the Father except by him. This morning we're going to look at another one of those I am statements made to his followers that did not come with a corresponding miracle. But there's some important doctrinal truths to be gleaned. He said in John chapter 15 verse 1. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. And again in John 15 and verse 5. I am the vine. And you are the branches. What lessons can we learn. From the passage of scripture. Which contains these two. I am statements of the Lord. First let us note that Jesus is the true vine as he says in verse 1 there's a subtle truth that Jesus presents in this statement often overlooked when discussing this passage in the Old Testament Israel was often presented as a vine the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 80 and verse 8 you have brought us or you have brought a vine out of Egypt you have cast out the nations and planted it. Despite all of the divine advantages given to Israel, though, they turned out to be quite the disappointment. In Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah presents a parable of a vine and a vine dresser. He says, beginning in verse 1 of Isaiah 5, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, he cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and in my vineyard, what more could I have, what, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned and break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. 
I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Likewise, the weeping prophet Jeremiah was given a message about Israel. And the metaphor of the vine was used there as well. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into a degenerate plant of an alien vine? Israel was the vine, but it became a degenerate plant. Perhaps these prophecies were in the Lord's mind. When he uttered the words, I am the true vine. Jesus is the true vine. And then he continues the metaphor. He says, continuing in verse one, and as well as verse two, he says, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Your version may use the word husbandman or gardener in verse 1. The father is the one who has planted Israel of old. And the father is the one who planted the son as the true vine. God will reject and destroy the degenerate vine. And the spiritual seed will be continued in the true vine that is in Christ. The branches are individual Christians. As his branches, we have a responsibility to bear fruit. Jesus said that his father will either remove us from the vine as non-fruit bearers. Or he will pr prune us so that we can produce even more fruit for him question for you and, and you have to answer this for yourself i can't answer it for you are you in danger of being taken away from the true vine or are you being pruned for more work jesus tells the apostles in verse 3 of john 15 he says you are already clean because of the word which i have spoken to you his followers, they were processing a lot right now. And they would be going through a lot in the coming hours. They would witness the betrayal of Jesus by Judas in the garden. Peter, perhaps his closest friend, would deny knowing him while he was on trial. And they would see him hanging from the cross in pain. Their pride, their secular, secularism, their self-trust, their vain ambitions, they'd all been swept away in the information that Jesus had so far revealed. But there's a prophetic nature to this analogy of Jesus as the vine as well, and the pruning. Even though they didn't need pruning at this very moment, they would still be pruned later on. They had a lot of work to do ahead of them. Jesus issues a command in verse 4. He says, abide in me and I in you. Abide in me. Stay with me. Live in me. Make your home with me. Your salvation depends in part on your decision to abide in Christ. In him, that's where all spiritual blessings are found. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ. 
Every spiritual blessing is in Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our sins. According to the riches of His grace. In Him is redemption. In Him is forgiveness. In Him is grace. In Him is salvation. Says Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 10. Without redemption, without salvation, we are without hope. And that redemption and salvation and hope is only in Christ. There's also a command to allow Christ to continue abiding in you. Abide in me and I in you. Allow me to abide in you. This is a choice that's made by the individual. Whether he will allow Christ to abide in him. He will not violate your free will. He will not force his word into your heart and mind. You must allow him to come in. And you must allow him to stay in. Apart from Jesus. We cannot truly do what he commands. Finishing up verse 4 and going into verse 5. He says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. This should not be understood as suggesting that absolutely nothing at all can be done apart from Christ. Because non-Christians accomplish much every day, don't they? Rather, it seems that he means to say that whatever work actually bears fruit for him must originate in those who are branches on the vine. Fruit is born only by the tree of which it is a part. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul recognized that he had no power in himself to do good. He said not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God. And he said in Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do not try to rely upon your own talents, but rather include God in the work that you are doing for him. Without Him, without the Father, without the Son, without the Spirit, you cannot do it according to His will. Jesus warns next against apostasy. And He promises blessings for the faithful. Look at verse 6. He says, If anyone does not abide in Me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and, and throw them into the fire and, and they are burned. Can a Christian forfeit salvation? Yes. The Calvinistic doctrine that teaches once saved, always saved, also known as the impossibility of apostasy, is patently false. There are numerous scriptures that deal with this point. But do we really need to leave John 15 to prove it? Jesus' words deny what John Calvin later taught. Jesus had already identified the branches as those who are connected to the vine. Those who are in him, that's the saved. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he that is the vine dresser that is God takes away. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, if you don't stay with me, if you don't live in me, 
he is cast out as a branch, withered. He says if those who are in him have to make that decision to stay in him. And if they don't, they are taken away. Those that are taken away and that are cast out are not non-Christians. They are the unfaithful, non-fruit-bearing Christians. They are individuals who were in Christ. But they've made that decision to be unfaithful or negligent of their duties. And thus they are removed from Christ, the true vine. Now make note here that it is not the responsibility of the faithful to cast the wicked into the fire. Yes, we must mark them. Yes, we must avoid them. Yes, we must protect them ourselves and the church from them. But the task of gathering and casting into the fire is the work of angels, not of men. Back in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says in, in verse 41, the son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And again in verse 49 and 50 of Matthew 13. There he says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth. Separate the wicked from among the just. And cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Let us take care that we do not take upon ourselves a responsibility that was never intended for us. Our responsibility, as long as we have breath in us and they have breath in them, is to try to restore them to the true vine. To the Lord. To his church. Let us focus on the blessed promise that the Lord makes to his followers. Look at John 15 and verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, that is if you follow the command that I have given you, up in verse 4, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is not a promise that anything that might be asked of God by any person will be done. But rather it means that a person truly in Christ and asking in harmony with the Father's will will have his prayers answered. Again, this is a truth that is taught elsewhere. That one must be faithful for God to hear his prayers and the things asked must be in accordance with the Father's will. Jesus then returns to the subject of bearing fruit. Verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Now, we haven't really defined yet what is meant by bearing fruit, have we? While the virtues that are evident in the life of the Christian are called by Paul the fruit of the Spirit, in Galatians chapter 5, that's not what Jesus is talking about. In John 15. Bearing fruit in this context is soul winning. Think back to the parable of the sower, Matthew 13. And the explanation that Jesus gives regarding the thorns and the good ground. He says in verses 22 and 23. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness and the yeah, deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But then in verse 23, but he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. 
Consider the Apostle Paul and what he said about the work that he and Apollos were involved in as, as ministers through whom the Corinthians believed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Did you notice that? Those who bear fruit, those who plant, those who water, they will receive their reward. If you don't bear fruit, you will be taken away. If you do bear, bear fruit, you will be pruned so that you can bear even more. Do we understand that our first priority must be bearing fruit? Must be soul winning? Do we understand that the money in our bank account will mean nothing at the judgment? Do we understand that the that more followers on social media means nothing if you do not use to promote it, if you do not use social media to promote God more than yourself. Do, under, do we understand that as disciples, we must make disciples? Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 talks about where our focus must be. Go therefore and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. Go and make disciples. We've been studying on Wednesday nights. His last words, our first priority. Be a disciple, make a disciple. Are we taking that charge Seriously. If we do take it seriously and we do bear much fruit, by this the Father is glorified. There is no task more important, there is no issue more pressing. Bear much fruit. We have no choice but to do this. If we are to be his disciples. The purpose of being a disciple. Is to make disciples. It is not a matter of trying to outshine one another. Or one up one another. But helping each other. On our way to eternity. And to help those who are out there in the world. Who are lost. Who are desperately in need. Of a savior. So how are you doing? Are you bearing the fruit that you should? Or are you in danger of being cut off? Our average attendance on Sundays is currently at 38 this year. That's a combination of both services. So those who don't make it in the morning, but do come in the evening or count it toward that total. And I understand and I hope that you understand the simple attendance is not the ultimate measure of faithfulness. But it is an observable, quantifiable number that can be a starting point as we think about this. So 38 is our average so far this year. How can we increase that number. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be participating in a door knocking effort on October 2nd. The Brotherhood Wide Door Knocking Day. It's a Saturday. Mark it on your calendar. Start getting ready for it. Exercise to get your endurance up. Those who are limited physically, pray for this endeavor. We've got a lot of neighbors here in Dry Ridge, in Williamstown, 
in Crittenden. They need the gospel. His last words were go and make disciples. That's got to be our first priority. Can we talk to our neighbors? Can we plant that seed? Can we bear much fruit and watch God give the increase in his kingdom? Right here in Grant County. Pray for that. Be ready for that. Make yourselves ready. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense, to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Can we do it? Yes, we can. We must. This morning as you reflect on the fruit that you have borne, How are you doing? Everyone has different talents. Everyone has different ways of bearing fruit for the Lord. Have you been taking advantage of the opportunities that God has given you? If not, repent of your inactivity and make a commitment to do better. Starting today. Continuing tomorrow. I'm getting better day by day. We can and we will bear much fruit here in Grant County. If you're not yet a Christian, but you understand what you need to do, you understand who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, that he came from heaven, and he walked among us, he lived a life of sinless perfection, and died upon the cross as a sacrifice for your sin. And you want to make a public profession of that faith? You want to repent of your sins? You want to be immersed to have those sins washed away? You have that opportunity this morning. Whatever your needs may be, if you need to respond to the invitation, please come now as we stand and as we sing.